is that old and reliable indicator of when a politician is lying. His mouth is open. There is, however, an exception to this rule when he's talking about raising taxes. Then you can trust his announcements. For this reason, it is no surprise that the word tariff derives from an old Arabic root meaning announcement. It was assumed that any government announcement was going to cost you something back in those days. Eventually, the word referred to officially published lists of customs duties throughout the shipping world. A tariff tr traditionally then is a tax on imports or exports, usually uh, imports. In the United States, tariffs can only be levied constitutionally on imports. The word tax is more general. It comes from the Latin word taxere, which means to handle in the sense of to examine personally for the purposes of assessment. A euphemism for invade someone's privacy. Uh, taxare is likely a form of the Latin word tangare, which means to touch, as in to touch what ain't yours. Thus the taxman first invades one's privacy and takes their property, property which isn't his. And the taxman's touch should be considered equivalent to the TSA enhanced pat down the latter squarely has his hand in your crotch, the other in your pocket. One takes your dignity, the other your substance, and it's government as usual. The hand in your pocket image should also be the official logo of the IRS and the Social Security Administration, although granted the eagle they both use now is even better. The eagle first spies its prey and then swoops down and grabs it and then flies off with it and then eats it. Now, as I said in the last installment, taxation in this land used to be extremely low, certainly low by the standards of our time, um, microscopic really compared to the standards of our time, and low even for their day. Yet while taxes were minimal, they were never, uh, there was never a time when, there were actually, when the people were actually free from taxation in that regard. So this section is not quite exactly how freedom was lost. Nevertheless, it's close enough to say as they say, uh, for government work. Uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, I suspect. Uh, before we begin in earnest, let me say that the history of taxation in this country, in virtually any country, is almost inseparable from that country's history of war. The taxes and the tariffs that helped to spark the American Revolution, for example, uh, were George III's attempt to recoup the, the debts piled up because of the former French, French and Indian War. And since we're talking about sovereign debt, the story is also inseparable from central banking. And we'll have to sep have separate topics for both the issue of finance, which comes up a little bit later, and then war, which is almost at the end of this project. Uh, for now, know that the whole picture of taxation, though gruesome in itself, is without context unless we factor in both war and central banking in the history of the nation. It's obviously no revelation that our historically low levels of taxation are not quite freedom, were lost, but it will be a surprise to most readers just how quickly and just how systematically they were lost. For example, as I said before, the revolutionary sentiments were raised in response to the Townsend Acts of 1767. These had been a second attempt after the failed Stamp Act to raise the revenues for Georgia's debts uh, in the American colonies. Now, the duties imposed were resisted, ultimately repealed on everything on that list except tea, and that led to the Tea Act of 1773 and then to the Boston Tea Party and so on. Uh, so for the principle of self-government, no doubt, but for the specific case of an 8.33% import tax on tea, American colonists were willing to fight and die if necessary. Now the irony here is that the Tea Act lifted tariffs that were imposed by the British, uh, well, lifted tariffs on the British East India Company. These were far higher than what the colonists paid and thus the Tea Act actually dropped the price of tea significantly for the colonies uh, overall, but they were still hated for that slogan, as you remember, no taxation without representation, and then of course we had liberty or death. So how was this mentality lost? How was this level of freedom lost? 
The Continental Congress struggled trying to get the states to raise revenues to pay off the debts for their war of independence. Again, war debts. Uh, after several failed attempts, and it's a whole history there, the delegates were convened in Philadelphia, and the deed we have referred to so much already in this project was done. The Constitution was written. Now, I've already discussed under localism and under states' rights how the opponents of that move created a public outcry over the centralization of powers. And one of the most crucial of those decried powers was taxation. Recalling those previously rehearsed comments and warnings, my short answer to the question of how freedom in taxation was lost is very simple. The Constitution. Uh, but let's just do a quick comparison. Americans, as I've said, were willing to shed their blood to fight off Britain over a very moderate tax on one item, the tea. Even the Townsend Acts before that had only placed duties on imported paper and paint and lead and glass and just a very few select items. So in other words, George III tried to impose very limited taxes to pay off his war debts, and over those very limited taxes, the Americans revolted. After the Constitution, however, Congress, led by Alexander Hamilton and his specific designs, immediately raised tariffs on their own countrymen, again, in order to pay off their own war debts. But this would be beyond anything the people could have imagined as tyranny under Britain. Here is a very partial list of items taxed from 5 to 10 percent, a little bit more in some cases, under the first Hamilton tariff of 1789. All right, uh, this, is a, this is a partial list, uh, but uh, here we go. Under Hamilton's first tariff, there were duties on all distilled spirits of Jamaica proof imported from any kingdom or country whatsoever per gallon, 10 cents, okay? On all other distilled spirits per gallon, 8 cents. Okay, so much for liquor. On molasses per gallon, 2.5 cents. On Madeira wine per gallon, 18 cents. On all other wines, 10 cents. On every gallon of beer, ale, or porter in casks, 5 cents. On all cider, beer, ale, or porter in bottles, per dozen, 20 cents. On malt, per bushel, 10 cents. On brown sugar, per pound, 1 cent. On loaf sugar, per pound, 3 cents. On all other sugars, per pound, 1.5 cents. On coffee, per pound, two and a half cents. On cocoa, per pound, one cent. On all candles of tallow, per pound, two cents. On all candles of wax, or some special waxes, uh, per pound, six cents. On cheese, I'm gonna skip over just a few elements here. On boots, on shoes, on slippers, on galoshes made of leather. The list goes on for four pages and it includes tea. Now that's quite an oppressive list by any standard. King George III's tyranny was mild in comparison to Congress's and Hamilton's, but this was just the beginning. Within a year, they increased the rates in the second Hamilton tariff, in some cases by a factor of two to three. They did it again in 1792. Tariffs ulti ultimately became a sectional war between the North and the South, Northern manufacturing, Southern agriculture. The political battle there, of course, boiled over into the Civil War. It was probably the main cause. And the same time they began levying excise taxes, which are special you know, taxes on domestic items. The first of these came with Hamilton's Whiskey Act of uh, 1791. That was a tax on all domestically distilled spirits, and this led to the rural producers, who were the main ones that were hit by the tax, revolting in the so-called Whiskey Rebellion, which was a tax revolt not much different than the Tea Party and other tax revolts uh, against Britain before the Revolution. But this time, instead of having their continental government behind them to fight and, and possibly die, and the option of calling militias from other states to choose which side to fight on, if they will, uh, the rebels watched 
instead as their own government conscripted an army of 13,000 men to be used against them, and they had no choice, and they had no recourse. Washington and Hamilton, reliving their old glory days on the battlefield, personally led the charge on horseback. It's the only time an American president led, literally led the battle into the battlefield. So the American government almost immediately became a tyranny, measurably many times worse than Britain herself would have ever considered. Taxation with representation did not look so great close up, certainly not as great as it had at a distance. And then things got really bad. How was the freedom lost, you might ask? Here's how it was lost. It was lost with those Hamilton tariffs of 1789, 1790, 1792. It was lost with the whiskey tax of 1791. It was lost with the excise taxes raised to offset the loss in tariff revenues during the War of 1812. It was lost with the tariffs of 1816, which were raised to pay off the debts of the War of 1812. It was lost with the protectionist tariff of 1824, and again, it was lost with its sister act in 1821, or 1828, I'm sorry, which was called the Tariff of Abominations, which raised the rates of the 1824 tariff. It was lost with the Morrill Tariff in 1861, which established the highest rates in U.S. history and set a precedent that reigned from 1861 all the way until the time of Woodrow Wilson. It was lost with the first income tax in 1861, again in 1862, imposed by the Union. The Confederacy was no better. It did the same thing in 1863, so apparently income tax was a bipartisan abuse by both the North and the South, and it lasted for at least 10 years. After a landmark Supreme Court case in 1895, blanket income taxes were considered unconstitutional, Congress pouted about it. Uh, they wondered what could they do. Wait, it was no problem. Of course, we'll just pass an amendment to the Constitution. One of the most difficult things to do in American politics, and yet for the cause of taxation, it was done. So it was lost again in 1913 with the 16th Amendment and the Revenue Act of 1913. This measure was championed by progressives of both Democrat and Republican stripes at the time. Since that time, the income tax brackets have been monkeyed with only a few dozen times. The lowest tax bracket has not dipped below 10% since 1933. It was originally only one bracket of 1% and only on people making more than $6,000 a year, which hardly anyone at the time did. It has reached as high as 92%, the highest tax bracket has. It's currently at 35 it was lost during and immediately after the Civil War in a whole series of excise taxes, again on liquor. This led to the whole legacy of Ridge Runners and the Moonshiners and the Rednecks and their mortal enemies, of course, the Revenuers. Uh, this led also to the creation of two behemoth government agencies that were involved respectively with the monitoring and regulation of the alcohol itself and with the taxation of it. And those two agencies are the ATF and the IRS, beloved agencies that we have. It was lost as federal excise taxes today persist on alcohol, tobacco, firearms, tanning, fuel sources, gas mileage, coal, phone line usage, trucking, vaccines, water transportation, fishing gear, harbor maintenance, airline tickets, jet fuel, and tires, to name a few. It was lost when FDR invented social security, of course, borrowing from the Prussian socialism of Bismarck, uh, admittedly, uh, but it was lost as those social security taxes have been raised 20 times since 1933 to keep propping up the failed socialistic system. It was originally 1% for the individual's half, reaching to 6.2% today, uh, but of course that's only half of it, the employer pays the other half. It was lost when LBJ piggybacked Medicare onto Social Security in 1965. The result meant another payroll tax on top of Social Security. And it was lost every time those Medicare taxes have been raised at least eight times since 1965, beginning with a tiny, insignificant, who could argue against 0.35% tax. Today, it's a 1.45% half 
of attacks an increase of over 400 percent. And this is considering only federal taxes. Local and especially state governments impose their own versions of these same taxes at each level of government uh, on top of the federal taxes. Okay. I have seen the total tax burden per nation considered as a percentage of GDP. The U.S. comes in high among Western nations with just under 30 percent total tax burden. But this is very misleading in only regarding income taxes. It doesn't consider Social Security taxes, doesn't consider the Medicare taxes, it doesn't consider uh, state and local taxes and excise taxes, of uh, 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 all of those state and local especially of every stripe. Including these things would send the American percentage much, much higher to say nothing of the total in those other countries who also monkey with their numbers anyway, as if 30% is not bad enough. So how was the freedom lost? It was lost for many reasons, uh, throughout many phases. We've trusted the federal government. We trust all levels of government somehow to take our money and then turn around and treat us well. We expect a bigger part of the loot to come to us than we send to Washington, uh, which is taken from other people. Okay, they've instead, instead of treating us well, of course, they financially raped us, but they've done it at our own behest. From 1789 until today, we have watched as Washington has gradually taken our money and spent it on everything it wishes, including frivolities and all kinds of money pits of which we can make another four-page list. Meanwhile, great ideas of freedom and liberty have come and they've gone. And they get barely more than lip service from the guys in Washington and the guys many times at the state level who are supposed to have our interests at heart. Do we have to say any more about the issue of how taxation, freedom and taxation was lost? We had something close to freedom in taxation. It was lost. And it was lost decisively in the areas of income, property, business, employment, savings, inheritance, public choice in schooling, hospitals, and things of that nature. Uh, there's no doubt taxes are not only too high, they're absolutely out of control. So we've seen now how freedom and regard to taxation was lost. Uh, the question, of course, as with all of these topics, is how do we get freedom back? Uh, so we'll cover that in the next talk.